Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the bench. Today on the bench, we're going to talk about the JFET Junction Field Effect Transistor. What I think I'll do is break this into a two-part video. And the first part, we'll talk about the characteristics of the JFET. And we'll play around on the breadboard a little bit with one. In the second video, we'll actually make a couple little amplifier circuits. Now, if you're a college student and you're looking for information to pass your next exam, like formulas and theory and things like that, this is not necessarily for you. This is more for the hobbyist who just wants to know more about the device. Though you might hang around and you might learn something. So a JFET is quite a bit different than a bipolar junction transistor you might be familiar with. Where you're injecting some current into the base and you're controlling a larger current. Well these are more of a field effect. There's not really a current. There's, there's more of an electric field that controls the current. So they call them transconductance devices. So on the gate of the JFET, that's where you put a voltage which controls the current that passes through the transistor. The neat thing about the JFET is because you're using electric field, there's not really a current. Well, technically there is a little bit, but it's very, very small. And for all intents and purposes, you can ignore that. So because you're not really using a current, you can think of this as very high impedance. So it's very popular to use these things on the input stages of op amps and uh, some real fancy high-end amplifiers. They make these things in metal can packages, and they match them really tight. They're very expensive, though. And they can also be specified with very low noise. Most JFETs are small signal devices, but because of advances in wide band gap semiconductors, they now have power JFETs that can control high voltages at high currents, very low on resistance. So yeah, just to throw that out there, but we're really more concerned with the small signal devices. So how does this device actually work? If you look back at a silicon diode where you have your N and P type silicon, I'm not going to explain what all that means. That's a whole video in itself when you get into holes and electrons and charge carriers and things like that. But I will say if in a simple diode here you take N and P type silicon and join them together. And at that junction, some of the electrons and holes combine and it creates what's known as a depletion region. And that depletion region acts to prevent current from flowing. When you forward bias the junction, the depletion region will shrink and at a certain threshold, current will start flowing. And with silicon, that's somewhere around 0.5 to 0.7 volts. When you reverse bias the diode, the depletion region increases and it makes the diode block higher voltages. And those voltages can be several tens of volts up to thousands of volts. But that depletion region is what we're interested in here. So down here I have a diagram of a JFET. Now this is not necessarily how it really looks. This is meant for describing how it operates. So just like NPN and PNP transistors, you can have N-channel JFETs or P-channel JFETs. So here is what's known as an N-channel JFET. So you have your drain and source, and that connects to the ends of the N-channel, or I'm sorry, the N-type silicon. And on the sides here, we have P-type silicon connected to the gate. So just like in our diode, where the P and N type materials are joined together, it forms a depletion region. And as you change the voltage on the gate, you can make that depletion region get larger or smaller. 
Remember, when you reverse bias the diode, the depletion region grows. So when we reverse bias this JFET gate, it makes these regions grow tighter. And, you know, you have current going from drain to source, and that will pinch off that current. In other words, the depletion regions grow so large that they pinch off the flow here. So what's interesting here is you have to use a negative voltage on the JFET to turn it off. You know, at zero volts, you're allowing current to flow. So that might seem like a problem because your circuit, you know, where are you going to get a negative voltage? Well, if you play around with tubes, you already know how you do that. And we'll look at that momentarily. In a way, these operate similar to tubes where the more negative the voltage on the grid, or in this case the gate, the smaller the current that passes through the device. But just like any other amplifying device, such as bipolar junction transistors, tubes, or even MOSFETs, you're still going to have capacitance between the, the grids and the plates of tubes, for example, or the junctions of transistors, because you have, you have changing voltages in an AC circuit, for example, across very small distances. So you have parasitic capacitances. And you have nonlinearities and things like that. But in this video, we're looking at what I call the lower frequency or DC characteristics of the device. So I have the little smiley guy here, which really gives this camera something to focus on so it doesn't wiggle, 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 yeah, in and out of focus. Okay, so what's revealed here, I actually had to write a few things in here I forgot to put on. What we have is a transfer function graph of the JFET, in channel JFET that is. X-axis is the gate to source voltage, and the Y-axis is the drain current or you know drain the source current that's flowing through the device in milliamps. So if the gate to source voltage is zero, we'll have a certain amount of current flowing. Now this is a hypothetical device. I just made a, a graph up for explanation. So if you look here at zero and go up where the line crosses, you'll see that comes over to the current here, a certain amount of current in milliamperes. Notice as we make the gate voltage lower, gate to source voltage lower, the current decreases. And at some point you reach what's known as the pinch off voltage or they might call it the off or threshold voltage where the current falls to zero. And in my hypothetical device here, uh, that's at minus three volts. Now again, with the gate to source voltage at zero, we have a parameter you'll see on data sheets called IDSS. And if you look at some data sheets, you'll see that this value can vary quite a bit, you know, order of magnitude from the same device. For example, one data sheet I was looking at, it showed IDSS being a minimum of 2 and a maximum of 20 milliamps. Well, that's one heck of a current spread, isn't it? And of a few devices I have, same part number, uh, they turn out to be around 10 milliamps, give or take a couple. But yeah, so be aware of that. The parameter spread of these things can be pretty high. But like I said, you can pay your money and get some really well-matched devices for critical applications. Some other things you need to watch for with the JFET is when you go positive on the gate, remember it's a diode junction. And at some point, you will forward bias it around 0.5 volts or so. You'll forward bias the junction and your voltage or signal you're putting on the gate will become part of this current that's flowing from drain to source. Another thing you need to be careful of with these small signal JFETs, this diode junction cannot handle a lot of current. So if you do forward bias it, watch out. For example, the device I have here we're going to look at can only handle 10 milliamps. 
but usually that's not an issue when you're using it for a small preamplifier circuit, though you still have to watch out for static electricity. These JFETs are called depletion devices because with no voltage on the gate, they're conducting. They're conducting at pretty much their maximum current rating. Okay, so what I'm going to do is move over to the socket board here and play around with it. One neat feature of these things is that you can make a constant current source. Very simple. You just short the gate and source together and whatever the IDSS happens to be with that device, you have a constant current source. I like to use them as a very simple constant current source for like an LED. These small 5 millimeter type LEDs and this JFET here, it's IDSS is around 10 milliamps, and that's a pretty good current for operating these. One thing you might be asking though, if this is just N type silicon here, can these be interchanged? Can the drain and source be interchangeable? And the answer is yes, they can. In fact, some data sheets will say that the drain and source can be interchanged. That may not be true on all devices, and I can't really tell you why. I'm not sure what would make the drain have to be the drain and the source have to be the source on certain devices. Maybe they, you know, uneven doping of the material or something. Okay, so I set up a little circuit right here. I'm using the MPF-102. Radio Shack used to sell them. When Radio Shack closed, I bought me a bunch of these things. These are meant to be RF devices used in RF circuits, but you know, they'll work just fine. I use them for audio stuff as well. But anyway, I have the gate and source shorted together with a little jumper there and the LED connected to the drain, a positive, to the drain going through the current meter. And it limits current to around 10 milliamps in this situation. So let me adjust the voltage. The voltage is about 15 volts now. So as I adjust this down, see now we're uh, under 10 volts, around 6 volts. It dropped a little bit. So it's not, I'm going back up now, but it's not a perfect current source, constant current source, but it, you know, it does the job. Now watch this. I'm going to invert this can, this, uh, duster can use it as freeze spray and we'll cool this device make sure I'm on there hopefully it might be out of this stuff well I cooled it and the current went up that's kind of opposite from a bipolar junction transistor you know when you heat a bipolar junction transistor the current goes up, but when I cooled this one, the current went up. So it's kind of an opposite effect. As this gets hotter, you know, as it's warming back up, the current is dropping. So at least when used in this situation, you're not going to have to worry about thermal runaway. Okay, I tried another one. They're all MPF 102s. These had the same current, but this one is a bit less. 7.7 .7 or so so yeah you can see that when you're building a circuit you might want to check to make sure the device is going to perform the way you need it well I was curious because I wasn't sure I didn't see anything on the data sheet so I reversed the drain in the source connections on this device and yeah I'm getting about the same current so at least with DC or low frequency, the drain and source are interchangeable on this MPF-102. Okay, so what I've done is set up a circuit with reduced current now. So now we're around 2 milliamps. And the LED, I don't know if the camera shows the difference well, but it's a lot dimmer. So here's the schematic. So we have our positive voltage coming in to the milliamp meter our LED JFET. What I added was a resistor here. 
And in this case, I just popped in a 1K resistor. So what this does is make the gate more negative than the source. And when we do that, when we make the gate more negative, or uh, VGS here, the gate to source voltage, you can see we're lower on this curve now, so we're getting less current. So let's check that voltage and see what it is. I'm going to move this out of the way. So let me check the gate to source voltage with the meter here. Negative 1.75 volts. So that's how we created a negative gate to source voltage without really having a negative voltage in our circuit. Last but not least, I'll show you how sensitive the, this device is. So I've I just have the LED connected to the drain and then source to the negative. And I just have this wire as an antenna. So when I bring my hand near it, you can see that it turns on. There's a lot of stray electrical noise from the mains. And it's picking it up. That's just because it's a very high impedance input. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this one up here. I need to save some of the fun for the next video. So what I'll do is uh, we'll, we'll play around with some amplifier circuits and talk about the resistor values and you know some calculations and things like that. So I hope you enjoyed this. I appreciate your support, and thanks for watching. So if we put a zero... Come on, John.